Hello, my name is Charlotte Seip. Today's date is March 26, 2015, and I am interviewing Dr. William O'Neill on the Ball State campus as part of the Ball State University African American Alumni Oral History Project. Dr. O'Neill, can you tell me where and when you were born? I was born in, uh, of all places, Ruleville, Mississippi. Um, and uh, I grew up, but I grew up in Muncie, so I call that home because I, I, we came north when I was two years old. And when were you born? In 1939. In fact, I got a birthday coming up uh, on Easter Day. Happy birthday. Thank you. What were your parents' names? William and Lou Ida. And my dad didn't have a middle name, so they t attached one to me, Eddie. <laughs> but my mother's name is Lou Ida, L-U-E-I-D-A. And what did your parents do for a living? My, my father was a factory worker, and my mother was a domestic worker for a while, but for the most part she was just a... Uh, Housewife. She's a housewife. Did you have any siblings? Yes. I had uh, two sisters and I have a younger brother. Were they older? My sisters were older. Um, I had one sister, the one, I, the one that uh, taught me how to fight. She's a, well, we, 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 we were close in age, <laughs> uh, 13 months apart. And then we had another older sister that was uh, uh, about four years older than me. And my brother is 13, year, 13 years younger. What were all your siblings' names? Uh, my brother's name is Calvin, and my uh, sister's names are Millie and Gracie. Okay, and were your parents, did they have college educations? No. In fact, uh, neither of my parents went past the eighth grade. Uh, they were sharecroppers uh, in uh, Mississippi, and uh, they... They worked in the fields rather than uh, go to school. And why did they move from Mississippi to Indiana? Well, for the economic uh, possibilities. And, you know, this was uh, uh, right at the beginning of the war, and there were some hiring in some of the plants here that were manufacturing rubber goods, et cetera, et cetera, and they moved here uh, to uh, have a better life. Did, when they came to Indiana, did any of the rest of your more distant family, like aunts or uncles, come to Indiana? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a pattern uh, that was established because when we came to Indiana, our grandparents, my grandparents were already here, and, and we moved in with them for a while until, we use that phrase, get, until we get on our feet, to my parents. And then uh, we had another group that came up afterwards, and that's kind of the way it was then. Uh, Families would move in together. They would blend until uh, they could separate and uh, operate independently. So you would say you were close with your extended family? Very close. Our, our family still is very, very close. Okay. Was your family religious at all? Yes. Uh huh. Well, when we say religious, uh, we were church going and I was, I, I was made to go to Sunday school. <laughs> and uh, it, that, that tradition is uh, carried on through our family. Uh, even even until today. What church did you go to? Schaefer Chapel. Okay. In fact, uh, Ball State is doing a project with Schaefer Chapel. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but uh, that was where I grew up. I grew up, my parents are uh, almost charter members of Schaefer, Schaefer Chapel. So when you lived here in Muncie, where did you live in Muncie as a child? Uh, on, on Russie Street which is one block, uh, f well, Highland Avenue is the main street that runs through uh, Whiteley, which is the, our, our addition. It runs east and west, and so does Russie, but it's one block over. So it's, it's about, about six blocks from Schaefer Chapel. Um, was your neighborhood diverse? No, the only, only diversity we had were bad kids and good kids. <laughs> I like to think God's one of the good ones, but no, we, the, if, our neighborhood was... Uh, all pretty much a black neighborhood. The the segregation was pretty strong back then, and uh, the uh, there were other other uh, cultures that were around, but they weren't close close by. And our immediate neighborhood was all white, all black. Did you have friends in your neighborhood? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. What did you do with your friends in your neighborhood? Uh, we had uh, games. We had outside games, a lot different from now. We didn't have computers, of course, but we had we had fields where we would uh, have kickball, softball, football, all kinds of games, and 
even at night, even the girls would gather. We would all gather together and do things like uh, cook things, make fire, and and uh, do things together. Where'd you go to elementary school? Longfellow. Longfellow Elementary School, it, and it's located in Hawaii and still in, is, is in existence, but in a different building now, new building. Since it was in your neighborhood and your neighborhood was mostly black, was your school also mostly black? We had, we had, the, neighbor, the, uh, the school was integrated. Uh, kids from another end of town, the other end of the uh, neighborhood came into uh, Longfellow. So it was integrated, yes. Did you have any black teachers in school? No. How do you think that affected you? I don't think it affected me uh, negatively. I th just think that I would have liked to have had that experience because even, to, even now I've, I've, I've never had a black teacher or a black professor. At, even uh, up until now with all the uh, years I've gone to school. Was education stressed in your family? Yes, from the viewpoint of uh, my parents had the vision to see that education would be a, a much better option than uh, not going to school. But of course, they, they never had uh, much experience of being in school. I, I don't ever remember my parents coming to school when I was all, all through my uh, school days. But they did encourage you to do well in school? Oh, yes. And encouraged, encouraged us all to uh, obey the teacher, do what you're supposed to do, and make sure we did our homework. What were some of your favorite subjects at that age? I'd say, at, at, in the younger, younger days, I'd say uh, English, because that's my strength. Uh, language arts, because I like to write, and I like, uh, I like uh, reading and poetry and things of that nature. Did your parents ever read to you at home? No, no. My parents were um, just a couple steps from being illiterate. Now they could read; they could they re they would read the Bible, of course, and the newspaper, but uh, they weren't uh, highly educated at all. They didn't have the opportunities to get uh, uh, any kind of sophistication in, in reading. So your love of reading came from school. Yeah, just from the imagination. I, I remember my elementary teachers would, uh, I, I can remember them very vividly, uh, the ones that read stories to us. And uh, really, Tom Sawyer, that, that, that book, was one that really got me interested in uh, uh, wanting to go into a lot of uh, reading. Uh, our teacher would read uh, maybe a couple chapters each day and I'd always look forward to, to that, the next episode. Did you ever face any racial discrimination in school when you were young? I, I guess as I look back, <clears throat> I didn't realize it until after I was older, uh, some of the things that had happened. But uh, not blatantly, because we were pretty much uh, independent in our own neighborhood, just among our own uh, black constituency. Uh, we had some things that happened at school that had some racial overtones, of course, because we had all white teachers. And uh, not necessarily that they're all going to always have a uh, uh, bias, but uh, there was some. Could you give me an example? I think that the ones that I can think of, uh, for the most part, I was a pretty good student in school, but uh, I, a lot of times I wouldn't get chosen for things that good students get chosen for. And I think there are several of us who are in that same category. Um, they would choose the white children first. But again, we didn't look at that as anything other than natural because that's all we'd known in terms of the history that's shared about uh, America at that time. So for middle school and high school, did you also go to schools near your neighborhood? Yes. I went to uh, McKinley uh, Junior High School, which is where the uh, Muncie Fieldhouse is located, that area there. Um, it's closed now, of course. And then I went to Muncie Central High School. Was that before Muncie Southside opened? Oh, long before Muncie Southside opened. Muncie Southside opened in 1965. 
I believe that's 64 or 65, and I graduated from uh, uh, Muncie Central in 1957, so it's quite a while before. So everyone in Muncie was going to Muncie Central. Exactly. That was the only school, only, only school in town, the basketball powerhouse. Did you play basketball in high school? Yes, I did. Were you, Muncie Central has been a powerhouse for a long time. Were you a part of those teams? Yes, so we were in rank number one most of the year. <laughs> then we got beat. <laughs> but that's, uh, that, that was a good experience. Very did good experience. you ever like win a state championship when you were there or come close? No, we, we won, uh, semi, win, uh, won semi state but we never won the state championship. The uh, team that preceded us uh, won a state championship, and I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the Milan situation. Well, there's a movie made about it. I can't think of the name of it right now. <laughs> Is it but Hoosiers? Yeah, the Hoosiers, that's right. Uh, Muncie Central and uh, Milan played, and Milan won that game by a real low score of 31, 28, or something like that. But that was a Muncie Central. It's, it's still legendary, uh, Muncie. And I, I started school the year after that, started as a freshman the year after that. Did you ever feel like, well, first, was your team, were your teams at Muncie Central mostly black or white, or were they pretty well It was mixed. mixed. It was mixed. It was, it was uh, very uh, much integrated. And... Uh, I just might say that that was one of the greatest experiences that I had in terms of learning to live with all kinds of people. Anybody who gets a chance to do something like that ought to do it because it really uh, it does something good. Did you ever feel like there was any racial tension at Muncie Central when you were there? Oh yeah, there was very much. There were the haves and the have-nots, and uh, I happen to be one of the have-nots. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know because I was uh, an athlete. I think that I got a little bit better treatment than some of the uh, other uh, black students. But uh, there were cliques, and there were places where the black kids didn't go, in this, even in the building. There's a gathering place in front of the uh, auditorium. Uh, it would be very strange to see a black student walk through that group that gathered there before school and at lunchtime and on breaks. So did you ever feel like sports kind of brought everyone together or were people still pretty separate? I thought sports brought a lot of people together because uh, it, it provided a chance for people to know each other and we had to interact in order to play together. Um, and that was, uh, has always been my premise that if people get to know each other, uh, it makes a world of difference because I think uh, bias and bigotry is based upon ignorance. And then once that ignorance barrier is broken, I think that you have a chance to create something good. Do you think it brought people together just for the players, or do you think it also brought fans together? Well, Other there's teams? a common cause. Uh, of course, being a, a real um, powerhouse in athletics, it brought people together. But the fans were all of one accord. They wanted Central to win at, at all costs. But it didn't, it didn't uh, cross the line of, of causing integration to take place. There were still the, uh, the white students and the white people sat over here. The black people sat over there. So it was still segregated. I mean, remember, this is back in the late 50s. Were there any sport teams or clubs or anything that were kind of off limits for black students? Yes. There's a group called the High Y um, that had an affiliation with the uh, local YMCA, and it was white students only. Was that like by rule or was it just? It was just, it was, it was, it was an unwritten rule. It was one that uh, you had to be. Uh, accepted in and uh, no black students were accepted. Were there any other clubs like that? To my knowledge, I'm, I can't think of any right now. Were you involved in any other extracurriculars or sports or anything besides basketball? Well, I, I ran track. Yeah, I ran track and uh, I was president of a Spanish club. I, I, I loved languages, so I uh, took Spanish and French and uh, I was involved in our Spanish club, which was a lot of fun. 
What events did you run in track? I I jumped. I high and, jumped too. Yeah, uh, did you? Yeah. And hurdle, hurdle was a hurdler. And once in a while I'd get stuck in as a broad jumper, but hurdling was my main thing. And then what drew you to Spanish? You said you loved languages, but why Spanish? In the, in, in the sixth grade, we had a teacher by the name of Mrs. Post, never forget it. She and her family would go to uh, Mexico and she'd bring back artifacts and things of that nature. And uh, she would, she, every year, I, I had her for two years in a row, the fifth and sixth grade, which was, which was great. She was always one of my favorites. And we made chili and we made uh, Mexican food. And I got interested in uh, languages and carried that out by taking uh, some Spanish classes in, uh, in uh, high school. And incidentally, I went on when I got my doctorate, I used uh, Spanish as one of my minors. Did they offer any other languages at Muncie Central besides Spanish? Yes, Span I had French also, Spanish, French, and I believe German. I didn't tackle the German. <laughs> but Spanish just stuck out to you more yeah, than Spanish. French? Yes, mm Spanish. -hmm. Spanish was one I, I took uh, most of the time. I took, took a year of French. So you ended up playing basketball at Ball State. Did you get recruited while in high school? I was more, I was, I, was, I was talked to, but I was more, more of a walk-on. During that time, there was the recruitment, recruitment uh, uh, frenzy that you have now uh, because uh, tuition was very, very inexpensive, and I lived at home, so I was a good candidate to come play there because I was cheap. But uh, those were some of the greatest days uh, that uh, when I went to Ball State and played, played basketball. Did you get talked to by any other schools besides Ball State when no. you were still in high school? No. Just Ball State? Just Ball State. Okay, so why did you choose to attend Ball State for college? It's, it's really but probably my only option at the time because the uh, financial situation was one where I just about had to stay at home. And um, my brother-in-law, who had married my oldest sister, he had gone to Ball State, and that was kind of a role model for me. And uh, so I kind of followed up and went into education just like he did. Did you always know you were going to go to college? Was it like expected of you? I think not. No, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I'm the first one in my family that, uh, that uh, graduated from, uh, from college, but I don't think there was a high expectation uh, because I don't think that there was the uh, knowledge and sophistication and the emphasis, because there were always jobs around during that time in factories and different places. So uh, college wasn't the uh, major emphasis right at that time. So when you came to Ball State, what did you choose as your major? Uh, education. I, I chose education as my major. Just general education, or was it aimed at a specific? I wanted to teach young kids, and, and that's I took elementary. I took elementary curriculum. And uh, that's where I did my first work for, uh, in elementary teaching. Did you always know that you wanted to be a teacher? No. I went to school to play basketball. <laughs> and by, uh, by coincidence, I just decided to be a, an education major. Why did you pick elementary education? Uh, I, I just, I, mainly because my, uh, it's kind of like a, like I said, my brother-in-law was kind of my role model. That's what he did, and he was later on a principal of an elementary school, but uh, that's probably the biggest reason, because I, I can't think of any other rhyme or reason. I don't know if I'd choose that now, but uh, that's okay. what I chose then. So did you ever change your major, or did you stick with education the whole I time? I stayed with it all the time. Did you ever have any thoughts about changing it? No. I know. Uh, it, it was a, uh, elementary is a pretty general curriculum, and you can sw swing over. But I did uh, later on uh, get a get a uh, an endorsement in in uh, in uh, science and one in uh, physical education, so I could coach. But as far as my major is concerned, no, I didn't. Okay. So, what were your first thoughts when you started college? Were you nervous or excited? Yeah, I, I think I think I was apprehensive because I was was a, a little fish thrown into a big pond, and I, I had I hadn't gotten out in the world very much, hadn't traveled. My first trip ever on a train was in my sophomore or junior year of college when I was with the basketball team. My first flight 
in an airplane was when I was a, a freshman in ROTC. So I hadn't been I hadn't been out much. I hadn't had much experience of doing many things. So I was I was excited, but I was I was apprehensive. Didn't last long though. So you said you lived at home. Yes. All four years of college. Yes, I did. Did you ever feel like? you were kind of missing the college experience because of that? No, you don't, you don't miss what you don't know about. I, 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 had, I, hadn't, uh, uh, I hadn't even considered that. I, I, you know, I, I was on campus with people who were going to school here and living on campus, and I envied that a little bit, but it wasn't, uh, I didn't feel like I was missing a whole lot. How did you get to school? You lived at home. Did you have a car that you drove here? And here, here to Ball State. Yes. Um, part of the time, uh, I eventually yes, I eventually had a car. I had a fifty-two Dodge convertible. <laughs> that uh, um, I that my brother-in-law still has. He keeps he, he keeps old antique cars. I gave it to him after I uh, got out of school. But uh, yeah, that was my that's my source of transportation. So you said you eventually had a car. Did that mean at one time during college you didn't have a car? Yeah. So a, did you take the bus? Or? Bus. Bus, yeah. Rode the bus. Okay. So did you make friends easily during college? I'm sorry? Did you make friends easily here at Ball State? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I had a lot of friends here at Ball State that are still friends now, sure. Did you make them mostly through class or basketball or... Well, both, and, uh, and, and a third option was uh, the old Pittenger Student Center. That's where all the students gathered any time they, they had, a, uh, uh, had a, a break or the, where they had a floating class or something. That's where people would come and they would meet. And there wasn't much else to do except to play ping pong or sit and play cards or just sit and talk. So was this friend group diverse, or were they mostly African American? We stayed in our own group, pretty pretty much. There's a there's a certain part of the uh, student center where the black students gathered, and that's where I would spend most of my time with them. And uh, but it was a little bit less segregated than high school, because the uh, college kids they they didn't there was there's no blatant effort to stay away from uh, each other, the two groups. So you said you walked on to the basketball team. Mm -hmm. Did you do that your freshman year? Freshman year. Mm -hmm. And how was that? Um, I just remember it as being fun eh, because I, you know, coming from Muncie Central, you know, people expect a lot from you. And uh, I wasn't a big star or anything like that, but I fit in well with, with the group and uh, I had pretty successful uh, experience even as a freshman. So you got to see a lot of playing time, even as a freshman? Yes. Uh -huh. So I got some of your team pictures from, I don't think I have your freshman one, I have your sophomore, junior, and senior ones. Um, and I noticed that they're not very diverse teams. Do you want to see them too? Yeah, I, I would like to see it. Because I still stay in touch with a lot of the guys that I played with. So I noticed that they're not very diverse teams. There aren't very many. No, many, not many black players. Blacks on yeah. any other teams. That's how true. did? How was that? I can share with you that there were some issues uh, that came up. Um, I think it was in 1959. We had a game, uh, overnight game in Evansville, the Evansville Purple Aces. The team stayed at the Vendome Hotel, and I think there were either two of us or three of us on the, on the black players on the team, and they wouldn't allow the black players to eat in the restaurant. And so I, one of the experiences I'll never, ever, ever forget is that because they wouldn't let us eat in the restaurant, the other players uh, refused also. So uh, the coach gave us money. We went across the street and all ate at the bus station. So, but that was a, an experience that was I thought was significant, very significant. So you'd say the white players on the team kind of were very accepting of the black players. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And were you close with? We were close. We we were, we were together every day, 
and we traveled together and uh, uh, you know all year we we ate together and it was uh, it was a real good experience that's why I say everybody ought to get into athletics because there's no color line when you want to win so were those teams successful at all or our senior year we were we had a winning record our our senior year <laughs> but the other uh, the, the other two years we did we won some games but we weren't we didn't have, I don't remember what the records were. A but A couple of them have the records written on there. Yeah, the, the, uh, we, were, we were over 500 in our, in our senior year. But uh, the years before that, I don't think we were quite at 500. <laughs> we weren't doing anything great. So, did, even though you weren't doing very well those couple of years, did the university community still like support you, come to your games? Yeah. Yeah, we had a. Um, in fact, we had more more students come to the games then than they do now. We played in the old ball gym. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but mm -hmm. that's that's where we played our games, and we'd fill it. Was, it was full all the time. It was always full when uh, when we played. So even though the basketball team wasn't very successful, there was a lot of school spirit. Yeah, very very much so. Mm -hmm. Was that true of other sports too, or just basketball? I'd say more basketball than anything. Uh, some in football, but not, not as much. But I, th but I think uh, basketball was uh, kind of the king here in Indiana at that time. Did you become friends with any other athletes from different sports? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you were all athletes, you kind of felt united? Oh, yeah. United. And, right. And, uh, well, we, had, we, we all had common goals, so uh, we would have different kinds of activities where, where we would show up at the same place and talk about our sport. Okay, so you were a member of the basketball team, and then you also were a member of a fraternity, mm -hmm. correct? Um, and what fraternity was that? Kappa Alpha Psi. And that's a black fraternity? Black fraternity, uh-huh. Why did you decide to join a fraternity? Uh, I guess it was peer, peer pressure. Uh, they uh, had what, well, they, they had a rush, of course, and they were, they were recruiting uh, uh, members, and uh, I, along, I think there were, like seven, eight or nine of us in our in our pledge group, and uh, all of them were my good friends, and we all joined. So you stayed involved with that all four years. Yes. And did you ever feel, for example, I found, I found your fraternity in your freshman yearbook, but you did not have a page in your sophomore, junior, or senior yearbooks that I could find. So did you ever feel kind of like your fraternity, being a black fraternity, was kind of unincluded in campus happenings? No, uh, not really, because um, I remember very well, uh, we teamed up with, uh, uh, I want to say, if I've forgotten what sorority is, a very popular sorority, uh, and we worked together in a variety show. We won first place in the variety show, and that may have been my... Uh, freshman year remember that may have been why we were we were touted in, in, in my freshman year oh I can't think of the name of the group uh, it's one of the popular sororities is it a black sorority no it's a white sorority, a white sorority? Mm -hmm. there are a lot of them yeah I know it if I heard but I can't think of it right now so you did feel included by the rest of the Greek organizations on campus? Uh, they were separate. They were separate. Like, I like the old saying, separate but equal. I mm -hmm. mean, they, there wasn't much integration. That, I think they, when they, when they um, melted the uh, um, variety show participants, I think that was an attempt to try to get more uh, diversity. But uh, there, the, black, uh, the black students stayed in the black fraternities. The white students stayed in the white fraternities. Were there other black fraternities at that time? Uh, we had one come on campus, Alpha Phi Alpha, but it was not chartered. So it was just kind of like a club, but it is chartered now, of course. Was that after you'd already joined? Yeah, after I'd already joined. So when you joined Kappa Alpha Psi, it was the only black fraternity? Yes, it was, only, it was the only one that you could join that had a charter, yes. Okay, so um, what did you and your fraternity brothers do together? Drank? No. <laughs> Not a whole lot. But um, we had we have had athletic teams. Um, we had study tables. Um, just other just general general uh, fun activities. 
dances. They had dan we have had dances. We had what's called a sweetheart dance, and that's always our popular dance where we sing our sweetheart song and things of that nature. So I know nowadays most fraternities and sororities are involved with a philanthropy. So was your fraternity involved in any? Well, we, we, we didn't have money to give, but we gave time. We, did, we gave time. Uh, our fraternity went out to some of the elementary schools and spent time with the kids, and especially those who were education majors. But uh, we, didn't, we didn't, I don't remember giving money. I, I don't remember having any. <laughs> So uh, that, that, I don't think that was one of our big things. Okay, so you were involved in a fraternity in basketball. Were there any other organizations you were a member of? Not really. I, I can't think of anything else that I was involved with. Is all I could do is keep up with things uh, doing that. I did. I did run track my uh, freshman year. I, I, I didn't. I wasn't on the track team all year, but Dr. Staley wanted me to come out and broad jump and I did <laughs> during the tournament and I did which was just a very very short tenure. Okay so let's move back to classes so you were studying elementary education um, were you were there a lot of African Americans in that course of study? Yes most of the most of the African Americans <clears throat> there were in education because you, you, you probably don't young, too young to realize it, but there weren't very many occupations that were flashed in front of African Americans at that time. Education was uh, the main one, and this was at, at the time I was there. It was a teacher's college, and that's what we did. We majored in uh, teaching. So, also, I have your senior yearbook, the whole page. Um, and I noticed you are the only African American on it, but you're also one of two men on it. Were your classes overwhelmingly women? Yes. And do you but think that affected you in any way? It was a good way? thing. It no, was a good thing. No. Uh, I don't think it affected anything. I, I had, it hadn't, it really hadn't hit me that much. Other than I knew that most of them were girls. They were. You had to work. You had to work to keep up with the curve on the grades, because <laughs> the uh, women seemed to uh, aspire to. Uh, they hung out the library a little bit more than we did. Were most of your professors women? No, I think it's pretty well split down the middle. I, I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember them being mostly. I, I'd say it's pretty much split down the middle. Do you ever feel like your professors favored the women over the men in your no, classes? I, no, I, I never. That never occurred to me. Did you face any racial discrimination from professors? I don't think so. I, I, I think that there is an undertone um, that the expectations weren't as high as they probably would were for uh, the uh, Caucasian students. But uh, as far as having any kind of blatant discrimination, I don't remember any of that. I, I, I don't remember having any problem with that. Okay, so you said you made friends easily. Um, are you still close with any of your friends from basketball or your fraternity or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Close friends? Yeah. Yeah. I still, there are some, well, when I say close friends, um, they live in Philadelphia and uh, have some live in Greensburg, some live in, in the Louisiana, and I still talk to them on the phone. And when, uh, when, they, when they come up this way, we usually try to get together. And we had a 50-year uh, a reunion of our basketball team where we had uh, over 40 of our players and their wives came back here on campus at Ball State. And we went on a tour of the campus. Some of them had, had been here for 50 years. And uh, that was a good time. But we still, when we got together, it was, just like, it was just like when we were playing ball, and that's how close we were. So were you on scholarship? Is that how you paid for school? Yes and no. Um, the scholarship, when you say scholarship, uh, the most financial burden on Ball State was for the students who were living on campus because tuition was only like $50 a quarter, something like that. So, And that, that was paid, tuition and books. It wasn't nearly as expensive as it is now, but uh, if you say scholarship, well, yeah, I guess that's what, if you want to call it that. I had <laughs> tuition and books. 
Was your freshman year because you walked on? Did your scholarship also cover no, that? No, I did. I I had to work my way through that. Okay, so you worked. Yeah, I worked. I worked uh, as um, I had a job in, in the music building here on the campus, and my job was to sweep down the stairs, sweep the restrooms, and uh, I also had another job off campus where I cleaned the office of clean the clean a barber shop down on Jackson Street. So that was my source of income. Did you work all four years that you were in school, or just your freshman year? I worked all the time I was there. I, I was I got married um, between my junior, sophomore after my sophomore year, right at the beginning of my junior year. So yeah, I was working. And how many hours a week would you say you were working during school? Probably twenty-five. I'd say twenty-five. Incl that includes uh, both the. Uh, uh, job here on campus and also uh, at the barber shop. Did you work during the summers too? Mm-hmm. Full time? Well, I was a lifeguard. I was a lifeguard during the summer and I managed, I managed the pool during the summer, all summer. Mm -hmm. So, hold on one second. So, you your scholarship paid for your last three years, books and tuition, yeah. correct? But you still had to pay for like transportation oh, fees. Oh yeah, I didn't get I didn't have any other no other perks. Yeah, was no meals, nothing like that. When you would travel with your basketball team, were your meals covered? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So some meals. Yeah, some meals. Okay. So you mentioned that you got married after your sophomore year, I believe. Mm-hmm. And that was in 1959? 59, exactly. And can you tell me your wife's name? Carolyn. And how'd you meet Carolyn? Uh, she lived next door. <laughs> when you were growing up? Well, we grew up, I ne we never dated, but uh, she lived next door all the time we were growing up. And uh, we both came to Ball State, and then we started studying together from time to time, and uh, that blossomed into what is now a 55-year <laughs> marriage. <laughs> was she like the same age as you? Was she in your grade? She's a year younger than me. Okay. But no, but, but I was a year ahead of her in school. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what was she going to school for? She, she's an elementary teacher as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she had to drop out a year uh, to have our son. So... Did you think that once you got married, did that kind of separate you from your friends or teammates because they were all still college students and you were moving on? Not like... really. We still, you know, we, we, the parting stuff was over, but we still were friends. You know, it's just it was still a, a, a very close knit group because when we were on campus, um, just to let you know how many, how lack how lucky we were in black students here on campus. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody, I mean, there wasn't anybody on the campus that you didn't know that was, uh, that was black. So our friendships remained the uh, same. We still had, ran the same circles, and, uh, but I, of course, didn't get, <laughs> didn't get to go party like I, I did earlier. So you were living with your parents your freshman and sophomore year, right? Mm -hmm. And then you married your wife, mm -hmm. and then did you move in together? And I don't know, we, yes, we had an apartment. We had an apartment. For your junior and senior years? Mm -hmm. Was that close to campus? It was close to where, where we lived before, yeah. It wasn't close to campus. It was. I had a car then, but it wasn't walking distance. It was in Whiteley. We, we, uh, it was in Whiteley, which is close to where we grew up. Did she have to work too? Yes, yeah, she worked at the library. Yes, yeah, she worked at the Muncie Library. All the time uh, we were in school. Okay, so you listed a couple jobs that you had during school. How did you get those jobs? I got got the job here on campus through the athletics. Um, Mr. Primer, Bob Primer, who was the athletic director at that time, he uh, worked that where he worked that to get to get most of the athletes' jobs, and uh, the other I just don't re I just don't remember how I got that. But I was a hustler. I mean, I, 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 I always had a job. I started working when I was 11 years old and I had a job ever since. So it, it, I didn't, 
I just don't remember how I got the job at the barber shop. So you just said that you've been working since you were 11. So let's go back a little bit. What jobs were you doing at that pin age? setter at a, at a bowling alley. A pin setter at a bowling alley. And that was probably the hardest job I ever had. <laughs> As I look back, it probably was the hardest job because at that time they didn't have the automatic pin setters. Of course, there were ten pins, and you had, and that was, when the pins were knocked down, there's a place called the pit. That's where the pins were, and you, we had to had a big bench above it. Where we would have to get down when when the, when the ball's thrown, we had to get down and pick up the pins, put them in a rack, and then get back up until the second ball was thrown, and then fill up the rack, push it down, and then get back up on the uh, back up on the bench. Yeah, that was that was work because those pins weigh about two and a half pounds a piece, and I wasn't a great big 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 guy at that time, but uh, I made I made two dollars and forty cents a day. That was exactly what I was going to ask. How many, you said a day, so how many hours would that consist two of? Two and a half. Two and a half, yeah. Well, two and a half. Well, I put it this way. It was eight cents a game, and uh, when, when I'd work in a league, the league bowlers would bowl, there would be 30 games, and uh, I'd get eight cents a game. $2.40, and then if it said doubles, you get $4.80 a game, but I didn't get to do that until later on. And then how long did you work at that job? Oh, I, I'd say probably three, four years. And then you kept working? Um, when I turned 16, I got my uh, life savers, life saving uh, uh, certificate. And I worked at a swimming pool uh, as a lifeguard for several years. Then, uh, then I became assistant manager when I worked in college, when I got to college. Was that a summer. public pool? Yes. Mm -hmm. What pool was that? That it's called Phillips Pool. Now we have two here now. That's another story I could tell you a little bit about. <laughs> um, I were, There were two city pools, Tui and Phillips. I was a lifeguard at Phillips, but I couldn't swim in Tui. So my senior year, uh, you talk about racial stuff. There's a big confrontation. Uh, we were going to integrate to a pool. There were several of us. And so several athletes got, the black athletes got together. I think there were four or five of us that, of course, we people knew us. We would played the sports at Central. And we went down to Tui and we went swimming. Now, uh, he says, that's kind of dangerous. Well, we had all the other students around just in case. So uh, there, there weren't any real big uh, troubles other than just name calling and stuff like that. But that, that was the integration of Tui Pool. So I know the public pools were separ or segregated, and then I also know that some of the parks were kind of segregated in that same way. Did you experience that? No. Um, our operation, we were in two parks when I was growing up. That's Heakin Park and McCullough Park. Now McCullough Park, they, they started, instead of McCullough, they called it Colored Park. It was, it was uh, out there close to Whiteley, and that's where most of the uh, black people went for picnics and for um, reunions and all that kind of thing. And that's where we played a lot of basketball. Um, on that, in that same park was the, was the, the, the professional baseball team. Um, it's way before your time. It was Muncie Reds. But they were the farm team for the Cincinnati Reds. It was there at the McCullough Park as well. Believe it or not, it burned down. The stadium burned down. <laughs> uh, and uh, that, was the end of, that was the end of that. But uh, the uh, Heakin Park is still very operational. And uh, there are a lot of different people who um, all races go over there play softball there. They have had a great softball league over there. And then basketball. Uh, a lot of different different kinds of activities over there. So going back just a second to the Tui Pool, can you, do you remember what year that was that Tui Pool was integrated? It was 56 and 57. I think it was, it was, it was during my senior year. I think it was after, at the end of my senior year. 57, I think it was 57. And did that event have like a lasting effect? It had some some residual effects because after all I've said about how 
um, uh, how the uh, athletes blended, one of the main components, main opponents of our getting into that pool was a quarterback on a football team. And uh, it had some effects there, so those feelings were never repaired. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, people go and come now, and I think that people don't want to be bothered with uh, integration. Now they have their own private pools, like over in um, Haltman Village. They, they've got their own pool. Incidentally, we, we lived over there, and for a long time we didn't belong there, but we've even, my, our son grew up swimming there. So how long do you think it took for, like, black people to really feel welcome at Tui Pool? I say not very long after after the numbers start coming in. You know, I I'd, I'd say in the next year or so, uh, because they, they were there were there numbers, and then people start stop paying much attention to it. Just just like I said, just a matter of getting used to a different paradigm. All right, so let's go back to college. Um, did you find your classes difficult? Only when I didn't study. <laughs> no, they, they were. I, I don't. I don't remember any any classes that were really, really that tough. Uh, except uh, I guess I can think of uh, Dr. Jimmy List. He had a class in biology, and we were studying genetics. And I remember that as being kind of tough. But no, not really. If if uh, we study, it wasn't that 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 hard. Okay, so you just mentioned a biology professor. Do you remember any other professors who had a big impact or stuck with you? Yeah, I yeah I remember I remember some. I'm just trying to think of their names. I can see the faces, but I can't think of their names. Um, I can't think of their names. I, I, it's just, it's just. Can you remember what classes they taught? Well, one was I, I remember a music, a music teacher. We we called it a brownies and fairies class, uh, because uh, all the elementary majors had to take it, and you'd have to learn to play piano a little bit and learn to learn to dance a little bit. And I and uh, the uh, lady teacher, I just liked her real well, and she and her husband both were music and music. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Dr. Legmont was here. I knew most of the professors in music over there, and I got to know them pretty well, but uh, she was the one that I had in class that I can, that I can remember. And there was an English professor, I can't think of his name, but he had a real heavy English accent that uh, he should have been in an Ivy League school. But uh, I remember him. Okay. I just don't remember names. So, you graduated from Ball State in 1961, mm -hmm. um, and were you excited to graduate, or were you nervous? Yeah, I was glad. I told myself the biggest lie that, it, that could be told. Uh, I said, uh, after I uh, graduate and get a job, I'll never be broke again. That wasn't true. <laughs> But and then, that was just kind of a, a joke I, I kid around with my wife about all the time. But yes, I was glad. I was glad. I was glad to graduate because I was, I was pride. My my parents were they had a lot of pride in that because I was the first first of our family that uh, graduated from university. So you graduated before your two sisters. Did they end up graduating from college? No, my one of my sisters did. But she did it later on, uh, and she was in her 40s when she got, she got her degree. Never did use it, but she, her husband was a superintendent of school, <laughs> and uh, she just never went back to work. Did your brother graduate? Yes, my brother did. He, he graduated from IU, and he was, a, he was a newscaster for a long time, for Channel 4 and Channel 8, and now he has his own business down in Indianapolis. So you weren't the only one in your family to graduate. You were just the first one. I was just the first one. Okay. And both of my grandkids, are, my son and my grandkids, both graduates. My granddaughter is a graduate of Ball State. All right. So you got your first teaching job right out of college? Mm-hmm. And where was that at? Muncie. I, had, I was ready to sign a contract for Cincinnati, but then Muncie presented a contract and I took it. 
Why did you pass up the Cincinnati one? Well, because I wanted to teach in Muncie, and I ended up going back to the school where I graduated, where I uh, where I went to school. I taught at Longfellow for one year. And then I told you earlier, I went back and got a special license in science and phys ed. And then the next year they opened up a uh, new school, Keener Middle School. So I went there. It is now the months, the uh, vocational school out on Elgin Street off McGalliard. But uh, that, I went to that school and I taught there for seven years, taught science there for seven years and coached. So your year at Longfellow, what grade were you teaching? Fifth grade. Fifth grade. And did you feel like your studies at Ball State prepared you to be a teacher? Or did you feel? I'd say, yeah. Um, I think the best experience uh, that helped me was both in, number one, in my participation where, where I'd go out and my first contact with kids, and then my student teaching. My student, I had a wonderful student teaching uh, experience with Mr. Pertleball, I'll never forget him. And what school was that at? He, he, he was at, this was at Blaine Elementary School, but <clears throat> he later on was the principal at Mitchell Elementary School where my son and my grandkids all went to school. So um, I, I'll never forget Mr. Pertleball. And what grade did you do your student teaching with? Fourth grade. Fourth grade. Some of those students I had in fourth grade are still around. I still see, they communicate with them on Facebook and so forth. Okay, so you did your student teaching with fourth graders and your first year of teaching was with fifth graders. Why did you decide to teach the upper elementary school rather than the I took what was available uh, at the time, but I'm glad because I don't know if I'd have the patience to deal with, with uh, tying my shoe and all that. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't have, there's no particular reason. I just took the job that was open. And I guess that's one they felt I was most suited for. And your first year at Longfellow, were you one of, well, how many other black teachers were there at Longfellow at that time? One. One other one. Two. Two other ones. Ms. Finley and, and my brother-in-law, Dr. Abram, Sam Abram. And how many other male teachers were there? Uh, Bushy, Granger. I'd say, say four. Maybe four. So not a lot. No, not a lot of male teachers. There weren't a lot of male teachers around. A male teacher in, uh, with an elementary license could get a job about any place at that time. So you'd say being a man in the elementary education field helps you get jobs? I, th I think so. I think so. I, th I think that, that, that put, put my application to, uh, above a lot of others. Mm -hmm. Do you think af being an African American? Yes, I think that helped too. I helped that. I think it helped too because the, the I was teaching pri primarily, well, predominantly black kids. I had had white kids too, but mostly uh, black children. I think that helped. They were looking for black teachers because they were very they were very scarce during that time. So you said at Longfellow you're teaching mostly black children. Was that true at the middle school that you went to? No, no middle school was. Again, that's another experience. <laughs> um, Keener Middle School, just opening. Um, but it was a place where kids from all over that area, the very, it was, it, was a, it was a poverty area, came into school and some of the white children had never gone to school with black kids. And they had never been close to a black person, and they certainly never had had a black teacher. So there's during that summer prior to the time that they were scheduled to go there, there's a lot of tension among the white community because they were afraid. And again, it was ignorance. They just they just didn't they they had not had any experience, and they had uh, were perhaps going on what they had heard. And they were had, they, they were afraid for the kids, but it worked out beautifully. And uh, I'm not bragging, I was probably their favorite teacher. <laughs> so there were more black teachers at this middle school than there were at Longfellow. No, Hill? there no. were only two of us: a Spanish teacher and me, at at the at the middle school. The Spanish teacher and I were only two black teachers there. 
So did you ever, you said you knew that some parents were like scared to have their children in school, or some white parents were mm -hmm. scared to have their children in school with other black children mm -hmm. or with black teachers, but did you ever get anyone say anything to you about it? Any parents? Not directly. I, I, not directly, but I, I knew that there were, I knew that there were fears there. I, I could tell kids don't hide their feelings, and they, they tell things. They, they say things that would uh, indicate that their mom and dad are scared or something like that. But it wasn't, it wasn't as big a problem as, as it may seem, but uh, it was there. There's just an, uh, always, always there that underlying issue, but it never was blatant. So you said you were at that middle school for six years? Seven years. Seven years? Yeah, I taught there seven years. So you said the first couple of years there was this fear um, do you think it kind of went away? I'd say the first year. I, I really, I, once, once the school got started, it just disappeared. There, you, you heard nothing, because the athletic teams were all good. Everything. It was just, it was just a great school. It, it turned turned out to be a real, real good move for all, everybody involved. And I don't think I don't think any kind of attention lasted for long. I think it was just that summer prior to, just not knowing, because uh, I remember the count of the. Uh, Mr. Clark, Burl Clark was a principal, and he established a committee of 12. And it was people from all over the neighborhoods, and, and they would meet together and talk about things. And that was the thing that helped diffuse uh, all the fear and um, the angst that, that people had. So did you coach at, is it Keener? Keener, mm hmm Did you coach there? Yes. What were you coaching? Football basketball, and wrestling. And I'd never seen a whole wrestling match in my life. <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun. You know, it's learning. I learned with the kids. It was, it, was, it was a good experience. Were your teams successful? Oh, yeah. We had, we had some good teams, especially in basketball. Basketball and football, very good teams. And was it a middle school? Was it like 6th, 7th, and 8th grade? It was 7th, 8th, and ninth at the okay. time. It was junior high, 7th, 8th, and ninth. Okay, so um, you taught there for seven years, and then what did you do? Well, once I got my master's, I was asked to be a, uh, well, during that time, there, there, were a lot of ten, there was a lot of tension in the schools. Uh, Southside had opened up, Muncie Southside, and uh, the Muncie Southside, they were called Muncie Southside Rebels. No black kids had been going there. So when, once that was integrated, then, then there was the problem of the racial issue there. The uh, fights over the flag. The kids, were, there, there were a lot of, the, that was during a time there were lots of fights in schools, and they were racial fights. This was during the Civil Rights Movement, and the tension was high. So I was asked to be uh, a supervisor, a supervisor, of, supervisor and coordinator of interracial relations. I had an office at each one of the schools, and I would meet with with uh, student groups and with teachers, and work with them on integration uh, issues. And frankly, uh, we had Muncie Southside was very tough at that time. In fact, they made headlines way out in California about uh, fights that were going on in school, and. Um, my job, along with uh, another white counselor named Roger Castroline, I'll never forget him. Uh, he is, uh, he's later in the, in the FBI, but he and I had the job of every day we would meet with the rowdiest black kids and the rowdiest white kids, and we'd have lunch together. They'd have to bring their tray down to this one room. And that helped diffuse a lot of the stuff. Pretty soon, instead of wanting to fight each other, they teamed up and wanted to just do other kind of dirt. <laughs> but it, it was a real uh, good integrative uh, integra integration technique. So it was like a counseling job? Kind yes. Of? Mm -hmm. So you got your master's in counseling, correct? Mm -hmm. um, Why did you decide to go and get your master's? At that time, it was... It was, it was uh, in order to keep your teaching license, you had to get a master's. And uh, that was just one of the areas that I thought I'd, I'd enjoy. 
Did you start the master's right after you finished your undergrad? I don't remember when I started. I know I finished it in 65. I, I, grad, I, finished, I finished my master's in 65 because I was working all the time uh, during the time I was taking classes. So I finished in 65. Okay, and then you got your doctorate too. Mm -hmm. Did you do that? Seven, in 70, 76 or 78, I've forgotten when. So not right after I the master's. I look Marine. Uh, so it wasn't right after the master's? No. You took some time off there? Uh, uh, yeah, I took some time off from school. I took some, I took some classes, but um, oh, oh, I had to do, at that time, we had to do a residency. And so I took a year off from 74 to 75. I took a year off. My wife was teaching uh, at that time, so we could afford it. And uh, I finished my doctorate during that time. And that's when I moved from Muncie to Anderson. So why did you decide to go and get your doctorate? Oh, I don't know. I guess it's just kind of hunger for more. Uh, I did. Ha I had a brother-in-law. Well, the, my, my, both my brothers-in-law, we were all in education, and both of them, they uh, got their doctorate about the same, well, about the same time. And we were kind of feeding on each other and encouraging each other. So we all... Uh, got our degrees. So after your first administrative job, um, you did some other administrative jobs, right? I was, I was an assistant principal at Muncie Southside. I was assist, assistant principal at Muncie Southside. I was, other than the, super, the supervisor's job was con technically administrative, and uh, then I uh, went on to uh, become assistant principal there at Southside. That, during that time, uh, that's when I, I took a year, a year's leave and got my doctorate. So you only were a classroom teacher for like eight years, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, did you miss being a classroom teacher yes. when you were doing these yes. administrative all jobs? The time I was, all the time I was <laughs> working, I did, yeah. I missed the kids. But I did a lot of volunteer stuff. and uh, I, But again, the reason I got into uh, teaching is because I enjoyed it and then Working with grown folks isn't as much fun as working with kids. <laughs> Was there anything about classroom teaching that you didn't miss? Not really. I I, I loved it. I actually I, I just I just didn't I wasn't making enough money. <laughs> that was that's the bottom line, and that's why I, I think it's a shame that teachers don't make more. But uh, that was a big reason. So after you were an assistant principal at Southside, then you went to Anderson? Yeah, after I finished my degree, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what did you do in Anderson? As administrative assistant for two years, administrative assistant to the uh, superintendent. Then I became uh, superintendent of curriculum and staff development there at uh, Anderson. And I stayed in that capacity for a long, long time. So in Anderson, you didn't really work with students anymore? No, not uh, no, not directly, no. Uh -uh. And you missed that? Yeah, I, I missed it, but you know, after a while, you, you, you're so busy, you don't, yeah. you don't think that much about it. But uh, I did establish some, some programs over there while I was doing it that had to do with, I always, I've always had a passion for working with black boys because of the st statistics. and. Uh, I started a program at one of the elementary schools called the West Side Leadership Academy. And that, and along with a tutoring program, a mentoring, mentoring program. Um, the West Side Leadership Academy was one where uh, I would go down and I taught, I taught uh, Spanish to third grade kids. And the, once, once a week, well, only once a week, I, that's, that's a, the time frame I had. But, um, I've always had a passion working with black boys, so I was I, ha I headed a group, a state group called the Commission on uh, com uh, Commission on Black Males or something like that. It's, it's, it's still in existence. There was one here, but I, I headed the chapter over there, over in Anderson, and uh, we would develop strategies to work with uh, uh, black males, mostly authority issues, because that's one of the things that. Uh, they weren't. They weren't respond. They don't respond to authority. Many, many of the young black kids, most of them are one parent, one parent families. 
and they don't have a dad at home, and they didn't know how to uh, deal with authority. So before you went to Anderson um, for Muncie Community Schools, you worked for an elementary school, a junior high, and a high school. Mm -hmm. um, which one of those age groups was your favorite to work with? Middle school. Why? Because they're different every day. <laughs> they're grown one day and they're little babies the next day. And uh, they're, they're very uh, pliable. You could, you, could, you could do things with them. And, and I think that was, that was an area where they were experiencing a lot of changes in their bodies and uh, getting their interests all diverse. And they were just in the process of growing up. And they grew up at different, at different uh, speeds. And it's just it was just fun watching them do that, trying to help them along in that process. All right, so when you got the job at Anderson, you moved to Anderson. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think about staying like living in Muncie and commuting to Anderson? Well, when I moved when I uh, when I took the job in Anderson, we did stay in Muncie for a while. And my wife got a job in Anderson also, and she commuted back and forth for uh, a long time to to to, uh, in, to to Muncie, but uh, eventually we, we moved here, and that was an interesting thing too. Uh, <laughs> one evening after work, we were coming over to to Anderson and to look at homes. We were trying to ride through the neighborhood. It was dark, and looking to see what what neighborhood we thought we'd like to move to, and we were stopped by the police. <laughs> and it was one of those things where there, we, we weren't breaking any laws or anything, but it was just, <clears throat> you know, you don't think of it. But when I, when I read about it in the, in the in news, it's for real. It's for real that that uh, stalking goes on, profiling. But it didn't help. I, was, I, I, you know, I graduated and gradu had got my doctorate, and one of the things, I, the first thing I did, I bought, I bought a nice, Big new car, big shiny gold Cadillac, and they were following me. <laughs> so. so you said your wife was commuting from Anderson to Muncie for a while. From from, from Muncie to Anderson. She was, she was she was teaching in Muncie and driving back and forth. let's see was was the other way around because I remember the little Volkswagen she was driving. She drove back and forth every day. I think she was teaching Garfield School at school so, at that time. So she was teaching for Muncie Community also. Yeah. What grade levels was she teaching? Third, third, mainly third grade. Was she always a classroom teacher? She never went to administration. Yeah, she eventually she was a, she retired as a principal. Okay, so you and your wife had one child, correct? Mm-hmm. And what is his name? His name's Keith O'Neill, Bishop Keith O'Neill. Um, you may have heard of his church. He uh, he has a uh, Destiny Christian Center. Have you heard of that? Uh, it, the reason I th think you might know it because he it has a lot of affiliation with Ball State. Every uh, the, the second and fourth Sunday, he uh, has a program where uh, any college student can come over and. And they, they have some delicious meals for them, no cost at all. And they have a bus. They pick them up, come out on campus, pick them up. And he's uh, got over 400 members there in his church. So he's constantly growing and doing real well. When was he born? He was born in 1960, so, July, July 6th, 1960. So that's before you graduated <laughs> yeah. from Ball State. Mm -hmm. So was it hard having... A wife and a child, and then finishing school, and then even after you finish school, working. Oh, was it yeah. hard to balance all that? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was tough. That's why I said that. I said I was so broke all the time. I said when I said when I got my first job, I said I'll never be broke again. Big lie. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't realize uh, uh, some of the uh, a, a teacher salary. Some of a teacher salary is not going to get you that much uh, extra money. Because my first contract was like. Four, a little over four thousand dollars for a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you ever feel like you weren't fully able to commit to teaching or your family at the same time? I've said it many times, and uh, I don't say it with a whole lot of pride. But I probably would, if I knew what I know now, I'd have been a better, better dad. 
I, you know, my kids came, my son came out fine. I mean, and he and I talked to him about it. He said he didn't realize any kind of issues, but I uh, I think that I don't think I spent as much. I was so busy trying to get a degree, so busy trying to finish uh, uh, all these degrees and stuff that I, w I would have spent more, much more time with him. But he turned out okay. So you said you would have spent more time with him doing anything particular or just No, I went to the, I went to the ba to the basketball games and to his he was a real good tennis player in high school. Went to those things but still uh, didn't didn't go to Disneyland, didn't go you know, all those things like that. And uh, that wasn't uh, high on my priority list at the time. Did he go to Muncie Community Schools too? He went went up to I think he went to the ninth grade. When we moved when we moved to Anderson, he went to Highland, went to Highland uh, uh, High School. But up up until that time, uh, he had gone to Mitchell and then to gone to Northside and then uh, we moved. So since you've graduated from Ball State, you've stayed involved in several alumni organizations. Um, Why did you choose to? Stay involved with Ball State. I don't know. I just, just always had a passion for Ball State, and uh, uh, I, I've, I'd go to some of their athletic contests, and uh, pretty soon they asked me if I would be interested in being on the uh, Cardinal Varsity Club board, which is the arm that raises scholarship athletes for scholarship monies for athletes, and I did. And it's president of that for a year, and I still support it. But uh, I get involved with a lot of boards. I, <laughs> uh, hospital board, that, that's over in Anderson, some of those kinds of things. I believe it's civic duty. I, I, I believe in uh, giving back. So you're now retired, correct? Mm-hmm. When did you retire? I'm, I'm, I'm a veteran now. I've been retired almost 16 years. Okay, so of the several different jobs you worked, um, in your career as an educator, which one would you say was most rewarding? The middle school job. I, I, lo I loved it. I loved teaching middle school. I loved teaching science. I enjoyed that. That was, that was, that was, probably, uh, that was probably the best days. Because those was dur during the days. I was young enough where I was still playing independent ball, and a lot of the guys that were the coaches there, we played uh, in leagues together, played softball, did a lot of things together. It was... This is good. Those are good years. So, in your retirement, is your wife retired too? Mm-hmm. She, okay. she beat me to it. <laughs> so, you two living together through retirement, what kind of things are you doing with your retirement? Uh, I've been on about every board in, in Anderson, and which is okay. I, I, I enjoy that, and I'm, I'm still on, on the hospital board. Uh, got a real nice... Uh, news article last week where we'd given all the schools I, I was I was I was president of the uh, what do you call it the uh, foundation or the hospital foundation where we would give things away we raise money people die and leave the hospital money so we spent it and we gave all the all the uh, all the policemen all the schools and all the big churches a defibrillator and there's a real nice article in, about a defibrillator was used to save a man's life last week. And that's kind of rewarding to see that that was something that we did. But now I'm on the regular board again for the second time. So, so are you doing any traveling or anything during your retirement? Not as much as we used to. Um, we have a place in Florida that I just gave to my son, and he and his wife uh, use it now. It's a timeshare down in Orlando. And... We, uh, this is the first year this past winter that we didn't go down. We usually go down, go down there. And we do little local trips to Ohio and around. So you mentioned some grandchildren earlier. Mm-hmm. How many? I got two. 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 A granddaughter and a grandson. My granddaughter is 34, 35. And you guys, you guys probably run into her. She's uh, the executive director of the Bewley Center. Are you familiar with the Bewley Center? I've heard of it. 
Yeah, she's the executive director of the Beaulieu Center. And my grandson, uh, you may have seen this picture on either on his car or on <laughs> a sign going to Yorktown. He's, uh, he has a, a State Farm franchise there in Yorktown. And what are your grandchildren's names? Brian and Kiana. And do you ha do either of them have children? Do you have any great grandchildren? Yes, I have four, one, five wonderful grand great grands. My granddaughter has a son that's that's four, thirteen, and he'll be fourteen in April. And my grandson has four boys, including a set of twins. And uh, I got pictures <laughs> that uh, they're uh, they're they're special. Can you share their names? Yeah, uh -huh. Christian. Donovan and Sonny and this Princeton, did I say Princeton? Christian, Donovan, Princeton, Princeton, Donovan, Christian, and Sonny, Sonny James, mm -hmm. named after his grand, grandpa's. And then uh, uh, Darshan is the older one. So they're all boys? All boys. All boys. All boys. And my granddaughter, she just says, don't, we, we don't want any girl anymore. She's spoiled. So she likes the fact that she's the only girl. Are all your grandchildren, great-grandchildren still here in Muncie or mm -hmm. in the area? Yes. Mm -hmm. So do you get to see them often? Yeah. You know, that's one of the things that we had. We talked about when we retired. We didn't want to get too far away from them. We, 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 we enjoy our family, close-knit. So why have you chosen to stay in Anderson during your retirement? Well, like I said, to be close to the grandkids. And we love our home, and uh, we've been threatened if we if we move. <laughs> Did you ever consider coming back to Muncie, though? I've thought about it, but then we're so close, you know. We're we're close, but we're far enough away where we don't get into their business. So we don't we don't even, even though my son's church is a wonderful place to go. We don't go to their church. We have our own church that we go to in Anderson, because. Uh, my wife and I both are bossy, <laughs> and we don't need to be in, interfering with what he's doing over there at his church. We go a lot, though. We go to special things and wonderful congregation. He has a, his congregation is made up of about, we talk about uh, integrating 50-50 in terms of black and white. So he's, he's uh, uh, really done a good job. That was one of his uh, goals. Now he's trying to get involved with some Hispanic ministry. And they have a growing nursery. If you ought to Google them, it's, it's something that, uh, that we, you'd be interested in looking at. It's, it's, it's really a, a change from looking back 50 years. What they have a, uh, he's on the radio uh, every week. Their, their uh, program, their, their church program is straight, their, uh, Church services are streamed live, and so we get to see them anyway. So, so you might might get a guess that I'm kind of proud of the kids. I can tell you. <laughs> okay, so you were talking, or we talked about your passion for sports. Do any of your great grandchildren are they involved in any sports? Well, just my, my, the only one is uh, 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 Princeton is was in a little basketball league. He's, he's only four. He's only four, but he's in, he was in a basketball league. And, Got pictures of that too. <laughs> we but, go over, we went over and watched them play. They over the Y, and my grandson he he was he went to school on a basketball scholarship up at uh, Madison, Wisconsin, Cardinal Stritch University. He went to Cardinal Stritch University on a basketball scholarship. So we are all a lot of athletic folks around. And you've like supported their athletic endeavors and mm -hmm. gone to games. Yeah. All right, well, let's go back. This is just touching on something you talked about a long time ago. Um, but you mentioned something about some ROTC involvement. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? Uh, I was in ROTC for a year, and I just didn't like it. Okay. <laughs> I just didn't, I didn't like it. I enjoyed the fact that we uh, took a trip down to West Palm Beach, Florida. That was my first flight I'd ever been on. Scared to death. And we were riding in a great big old C-119 cargo plane, which on paper is not supposed to be able to get off the ground. But uh, we got there and back, and that was a good experience. Again, that was another blending experience because I think uh, 
there were only two black men that were on that whole plane that uh, took that trip down there. But you didn't like ROTC? I didn't enjoy it. Why not? Had to dress up on Wednesday. Had to, had, had to dress up on Wednesday. Had to have your shoes shined and all that stuff. It was, it was very highly disciplinary. It was, it was good for you, I'm sure. But I just didn't. I just didn't think I'd want to spend my career in, in the uh, armed services. So, were you ever um, growing up in like the '60s and '70s? Well, not really '70s anymore. But um, were you ever um, afraid to get drafted, or did any of your friends get drafted? No, I never. I never got drafted. I, I wasn't afraid of getting drafted. I thought I probably would, but uh, I, I could have gotten a deferment. They, they were giving deferments at that time, but I, and I don't know if I would have done that or not, but I, never, I just never got drafted. It may have been because at that time I was the only son that was, my, my, my uh, brother is 13 years younger than me, but uh, for some reason I never got drafted. I had some some kids, that, some of the guys I grew up with, went to the Army and Air Force and uh, voluntarily, those that didn't go to college. But my best friend, who's who went on with the elementary and high school, he's he was a uh, he never did he never got drafted either, and he lives in Philly, Philadelphia. All right. So during the Civil Rights era, era you're talking about you were working for Muncie Community Schools. Mm -hmm. Um, in that administrative role. Um, did you have any personal involvement in any civil rights protests or demonstrations or anything? Yeah, I, I was around the edge. I, I, I wasn't on the front line. I was just around the edge, and I was just uh, supportive. We'd marched on, 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 on several occasions on, on, diff on different things, but it wasn't anything like uh, you see on TV or anything like that. Um, we had a lot of causes during that time. There are a lot of things that were going on. Um, for instance, um, as much as I love Pizza King now, we couldn't go inside the Pizza King to eat. There wasn't a restaurant in Muncie that we could go into and sit down and eat. We could order from the back door. And this is so ironic about it. My sister, my older sister, worked at a place called Payne's Cafe downtown. and. She, she washed dishes and stuff like that, but we couldn't go in there to eat. And uh, that was all, that was, that was just very common uh, during, during that period of time. But uh, places like we'd go and sit in on, uh, at Pizza King, we did that. Um, just things of that nature, but this is just around the edge. We didn't go out in the riot and throw, throw rocks or anything like that. So in... 1968, I believe you would have been at Keener still? I was just leaving Keener right right around then, yeah. Okay. Um, do you remember what you were doing when you learned that Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated? No, I remember right afterwards, but I, I don't remember what I was doing. No, I don't. I, what do you, I don't. What do you remember about right afterwards? Um, anger. Lots of anger. Lots of anger. Um, phone ringing. Talking back and forth to people and uh, antici anticipating a lot of trouble. And sure enough, it was, it, it was, that was, that was a very, some real tough times. Some real tough times. I remember when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. I remember what I was doing then. I was in a classroom when it was announced and I'll never forget there was one of the kids in my classroom after it was announced he had had his head on the desk and it was announced and all the other kids were just so so excited and uh, unhappy about it and then he said bang bang. I mean he made a joke out of it. That w it wasn't it wasn't a a good situation, but when Martha, Martin Luther King uh, was killed, uh, that was a real, real uh, excitable time, real sad time. Mm. 
I never was a civil rights uh, uh, activist per se, but uh, I had a lot of appreciation for what a lot of people went through. This is one of the things I talk to uh, many of our black boys about, especially my grandkids when they were little and, and my great grandson now. Um, I try to impress upon them all the sacrifices that were made. And I used to know, uh, I'm not a real Jesse Jackson fan, but he said something I thought was very uh, inspirational, and that is that of what value is having the door uh, open if you refuse to walk through it, the door of opportunity. And uh, I believe in that. I, I, I think that these kids just don't have any idea of, of uh, um, what people have gone through to get them what they have, the opportunities they have. Even my own great grandson, <clears throat> the 114, he, he just can't conceive of the idea that uh, you can't go anywhere you want to go. I said, you don't have that freedom without uh, a lot of sacrifices that have taken place. So. But it's been a good life. and. I, I, the one thing I regret, and that is that my parents didn't get to see a black president. Never had a dream that would happen, so. So did you vote for Barack Obama? Yes. And when it was announced that he won, how? How'd you react to that? I was elated. I was elated. And, and you know, the strange thing is uh, <clears throat> I wasn't so much atta attached to his policies per se, but I just thought that it was a historic moment because my parents were sharecroppers. And we have such a history uh, that the... Uh, The election was, uh, it was just unbelievable to me. But I think, it, it, again, it, it, uh, it opened, opened some doors. I say to see, see some of the things that are happening now with his presidency, but and I'm not that much into politics, but uh, some of the things that are happening here in this country now are, they don't, they don't shine very well, they don't reflect on us very well. So you said you wish your parents could have been alive to see the first black president. How mm -hmm. do you think they would have reacted to I that? I don't think, I, I, if I could talk to them now, uh, I, I, could, I, could, I, I could see myself telling them that now, and they said, you're kidding. They wouldn't believe it. They, I mean, the, the, way, the, thing, the way things have happened, they, they wouldn't be able to believe it. Because I wouldn't have believed it uh, 20 years ago. I wouldn't have believed it. But people who say we haven't come a long way, they are very wrong. Things have happened. Um, in my almost 76 years, I've seen a lot of them. There are a lot of things that have happened that have uh, been good. They're not, they're not all finished. I think they'll continue to get better. But uh, I think the part of it now <coughs> that's got to get better is attitudinal things. And you can't, you can't legislate attitude. Uh, you can legislate actions, but you can't legislate attitude. And I think this uh, recent thing with this, um, this kid was in Oklahoma was shouting on the bus. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I don't think I heard about that. Mm -hmm. You guys got to read that paper, <laughs> read the news. No, there's there's a. Uh, Remember the Sigma Alpha Exelon, it was Sigma Alpha Sigma? It's, a, it's for one of the fraternities, one of the white fraternities. Oh, it was, I think, Sigma Alpha Epsilon, yeah. Yeah. I know um, what you're talking about now. Yeah. I got it. Um, I felt so sorry for him. I, I, I guess a lot of people wouldn't have felt sorry for him when he was trying to <clears throat> explain himself. Uh, he, he had a press conference, and uh, he was, he was uh, just overly apologetic. But I don't think, he, he said he understood. Now, after he sat down and talked with a lot of the, uh, the pastors and the, some of the people who were trying to 
get the thing resolved. He said he understands this, the historic meaning of some of the things that he said, and he said he'd never, he wouldn't have said it if he'd known. It's just ignorance. These people don't know. But I felt sorry. For that. I, that, I wouldn't want my son to be in a position like that. So I know how his parents must have felt. So a little bit earlier you were talking about some, that there have been some things recently in the news that have reflected poorly on America. Um, besides that incident, were there any others that you were? I, I think the way uh, some of the, <clears throat> I don't want to get political, but some of the Republicans are, are um, well, when McConnell said that his whole objective in life is to make sure that Barack Obama didn't have a second term, that had to do with his, I don't think it had to do with his policies or anything. It was just that a lot of, a lot of white people have a whole lot of trouble coming under the direction of a black man. I've experienced that in my jobs. A lot of people have a whole lot of trouble dealing with a black boss. And I think that that's, that mentality, it's, it's, it runs through a lot of the Congress. And they've done everything, everything that Obama has done. If he does it, they don't want to do it. If he says yes, they say no. So I, I just think that that's unfortunate. And taking color out of it is just not good for the country, regardless of what color. I mean, when there's that much dissension. I don't th I, in my lifetime, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a terrible cold. And in my lifetime, I don't think I have ever seen as much dissension as there is among the two parties. And I, I can't help but think a lot of it has to do with uh, because calling the guy calling the guy a a, a, a non a non American and saying he's un American and a communist and all that stuff that's 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 not and showing respect for the position of president when someone can stand up one of the one of the legislators can stand up and and call him a liar right there in front of the whole. Delegation. I, I think that's I think that's way over the over the top. Just my opinion. So can we talk? You were talking about um, how you like working with black males because um, they're considered like an at-risk population. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. Um, can we talk about some of the issues that face that black males face? Um, especially recently, like the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, or um, the high incarceration rates of black males? The high incarceration rate is one I'm very concerned about. Now, the shooting of Michael Brown, I mean, those are isolated incidents, and there may or may not be issues that uh, make a difference, but I do know the statistic that says if I had five boys, well, this was probably 10 years ago, if I had five boys that were born to me, I can count on three out, of, well, three of the five either being in jail or killed by the time they're 25 years old. That's a scary statistic. And the incarceration rate is, I don't know, it's, it's probably four or five times that for, for, for African Americans than it is for uh, other races. But the thing that's most disturbing is some of the things like just down in Indianapolis the other day, they found four people murdered, blacks killing blacks. What's causing that? I don't know. I don't know the whole answer. I, I've got my own ideas, but I just think that that's one of the, that's one of the scariest things you can think of. More black people kill each other than are killed in automobile accidents over a period of a year. Any day that you look in the newspaper, the Indianapolis paper, you're going to find that probably two or three people have been shot or killed in some way by some homicide, and most of the time it's black. That bothers me. So you said you had, you said you don't know the whole answer to why this is all happening, but you said you had some ideas. Would you be okay sharing some of those? I think a lot of it's economic. And I think a lot of it is um, the mindset that we put on some of our young people that they're owed something. And if they don't get it, they're gonna react. 
and get mad at people. I, I just, I just don't. I just, I just think we've got to get off of that, cause I'm black stuff. And a lot, of, a lot and a lot of uh, kids were brought up with that. They're not gonna give. You're not gonna get that because you're black. Well, if they're if they're growing, uh, grow, uh, grow up, feeling that they're owed something, they're not gonna aspire to do something on their own as as much. When uh, aren't as likely to aspire to do something on their own. So I think that it's a lot of our own fault, the way we our kids are growing up. We've lost a couple of generations. Of, of uh, parenting, I'm, and this is not just blacks. I think the whites, whites as well. Uh, some of the things that kids are doing now, they wouldn't have done that during the time I was growing up. Uh, and, uh, of course, they've got a menu of items that we didn't have back then. Different kinds of things to get in trouble with, drugs and so forth. But um, I just think that uh, we've lost a couple of generations of kids by lack of parenting. Look at our divorce rate. And uh, you know, if someone gets married and expects to uh, get out of it as soon as they get angry with somebody, it's, it has an effect on the kids too. So when you work with young black males, what do you try to instill in them or what do you try to teach them? How to deal with authority. Everybody's gotta have a boss, whether it be, <laughs> Uh, at work, or or the or the wife, eventually <laughs> her husband, uh, not to be angry, be able to do. see. That's one of the things that, that I appreciate so much about my parents. Poor, poor, poor. Didn't get education. Sharecroppers. But they weren't. They didn't. They taught us not to be angry. Don't be angry. Be ambitious. Yeah. So, and I think that. A lot of our kids aren't taught that. They get angry and they react. So you talked just a second ago about the high divorce rate and how people get divorced just after like an argument. Um, you and your wife have been married for over 50 years. Mm -hmm. It should um, be 56 June 13th. So what do you think is like the key to having such a long and happy marriage? Tolerance. Tolerance. I tell her all the time I tolerate her. No, no we, we, it's just a give and take. I, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is except you just you got to be careful in picking them first, in the first place. We were just fortunate in that I think we picked the right people. You know, we're combat compatible. We don't like the same things. She doesn't like sports. I love sports. She doesn't like sports. She uh, is very religious, and I, and I and I, don't misunderstand me. I'll, I'm a believer. I go to church, but I, I don't get over. I don't get carried away with it, you know. But uh, we've got we're, we're very different. But we we've learned to tolerate each other, and both of our parents. Uh, my parents were married 60, 68 years. So, divorce is just not a, a word that comes in the, comes to mind in our family. So. so if you could give like one piece of advice to a couple that's about to get married, what would you tell them? Don't do it unless you can get mad and don't do it unless you can get angry and make up because, uh, I don't know, I, I think they need, people just got to be sure. They got to at least feel sure. Nobody's guaranteed that that's going to work, but. Some of them get married because of just lust and passion, and because they think it's a good idea. But there, are, thing after marriage, things change a lot. You don't see all the problems and so forth the person has until after you get married and you get into it. And if you can't handle that, it's tough. But tolerance, I guess, just tolerance is. And, and, and uh, I, I mean, I'm not a marriage counselor. I don't have. A, I don't have an answer per se, but that's what I'm saying. My my opinion is just you just gotta you just gotta stick it out and believe in what your vow said, for better or for worse. All right. So before we started the interview, you were talking about how you like coming back to campus because it's changed so much and you like seeing all that growth. 
Um, can you just tell me a little bit about that? Oh, okay. Uh, Ball State, like I said, when I was in school here, we had probably uh, five or six academic buildings. And, we, for instance, the old gym over there, like I said, we played then, uh, the old ball gym, they've had two new gyms since then. The, the university gym and then the, the, uh, the uh, I call it the Remy Callum gym, the uh, new one. Uh, everybody knew everybody. Uh, the campus wasn't hard to, to, to navigate, but now it's, it's, spread, it's just spread out so much. It's, it's really grown, and I think the, there's been a lot of pride taken in the kinds of uh, buildings and the kinds of uh, decor that's been put on campus. It's a beautiful campus. It's a beautiful campus. And I, that's what I hear from uh, a lot of people that come back and they feel a lot of, have a lot of pride in that. The old student center, I, I haven't been in there for years and years this it's still in the same place isn't it i but think so it's 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 uh, it's got to be a lot different from when we were there it's just uh they sell you sell you sell burgers and that's about it it's it's a lot different but uh it's it, this campus has really grown there's been a lot of pride taken in uh beautifying it and, and the uh the foliage here is is really you know trees and some of the things that they put in are well thought out and beautiful. So what's, like if you had to say your one favorite addition to campus since you were here? Oh, that's hard. I don't know, I, I guess I'd probably say the Bracken Library. I might use it a little bit more than I did the old one. <laughs> the old library was a dump. <laughs> but. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I really don't know because I'm very impressed with the, uh, with the uh, Emmons Auditorium. That's something that was, and uh, Dr. Emmons, you ha not knowing him, you've missed a treat. He's, he's, he's a great guy. Uh, the dorms are a lot nicer. They used to have, uh, one of the women's dorms was a barracks. Uh, if you remember those, Lucina, wood, I it, it, yeah, Lucina Hall. It, 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 was, it looked like a uh, something on the, on the, on that movie style, like uh, nineteen or whatever. It, it was just it just looked like an army barracks, and uh, they, I don't think they have any of those here now, do they? Like Lucina is still here, but they've redone it. Oh yeah, they, you know, they've, they've they've redone all that. It's it's improved. The conditions here for for students here are are much much better, but they're paying a lot more money. <laughs> so you're very proud to say that you graduated from Ball State. Yes, University. yes, mm -hmm. very. Ball State has a, has a has a sterling reputation. At one time, it was it was one of the top three. Uh, teachers colleges in the country. I don't know where the ranks now, but I, it's it's got a, it's got a good reputation. Ball State has a, a good reputation, and had Dave Letterman. I don't know if you saw it the other night. Dave Letterman's holding up Ball State shirts. <laughs> so, Jim Davis. Mm -hmm. I don't, have you have you have, did you ever get to know him? Jim Davis. He wrote Garfield, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's a good friend. He, um, uh, I remember when he was poor, we used to play tennis. Did you go to school with him? Yeah, well, he, he was a few years behind me, but I got to know him because we played tennis together. And um, while he's waiting on his turn to play tennis, see, we were, we were teachers. Some of, there were several of those teachers were there. His wife was a teacher, his first wife. But he was sitting doodle. He worked for an advertising company at the time, and uh, we would tease him about getting a real job. Why don't you get a real job, Jim? <laughs> oh, we lived. We lived to talk about that again. Do you still stay in contact with him at all? Uh, I haven't talked to him. I ran into him at uh, I think it was Ruby Tuesdays, maybe a couple years ago, and introduced him to my son, my grandson. My grandson was with me. Great grandson was with me, and. Uh, 
because it had no impact on him. He said, well, well, well. so he did Garfield. So <laughs> he was in the square SpongeBob sport pants at the time. Um, so you mentioned something about Dr. Emmons earlier. Um, was he the president when you were here? Yes, uh huh. Did you personally know him or just know well, he come him? Well, he'd, he'd come to the athletic events and he would, he'd say he'd come talk to us once in a while, you know. They, it wasn't anything, anything that we were friends with by any means. But uh, uh, I think he knew who we were because he followed the athletics. And he said um, that we missed out not knowing him. He's just, he just a nice guy, supportive. And uh, he was all for the uh, progress of Ball State. He was, he was, he's, he's really a, 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 a real good, uh, what do you call it? He represented Ball State well, put it that way. There's a word that's not coming out. All right, well, before we close this interview, is there anything else that I haven't asked you about that you would like to share, pe share with people about your life or your career or your experiences at Ball State? No, I, I guess I can't speak with any more pride than I already have because I think it's been, that's one of the reasons, Ball State is one of the, one of, is one of the several reasons that I feel very strongly about giving back to the community because Ball State was pretty good to me. I mean, I'm, I didn't get any perks that anybody else didn't get, but uh, I had an opportunity and it provided me some opportunities. And unfortunately, I was able to take, I've had a lot of uh, good support with some of the professors, some of the, uh, I can't think of his name, that one was over there in the, uh, those in the uh, administration building. Oh. Whenever we needed some money, he was, he was, he was in, the, in the loans, the loan area. He would always, you know, if we need 12 or $13 or something like that, he would always find a way to get it for us, and we go pay it back. But uh, those are the kinds of things. It was just much more, it, it, it was small enough where we, we had some intimate uh, kinds of contacts with people. I can't think of his name. He's just taught psychology. Funny. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Well, then on behalf of the Ball State University African American Alumni Oral History Project, I would like to thank you for your participation. Okay.